welcome creatives, community, and kind folks to RPG with DBJ. I am your unseen host, DBJ, and today, uh, continuing our deep dive into what I'm choosing as some of my favorite um, tabletop role-playing games uh, with a theme towards, excuse me, Black and Indigenous peoples this month, we are looking at the Star Shaman Song of Plain Gia. Now, in this review, we're going to go page through the, the PDF. There is, uh, the physical copies are on delay. Uh, as we know, worldwide, there are issues with, there are plenty of issues with uh, delivery and printing and costs and things of that nature. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed that I'll receive this in my hand, but this is one that's been in the in the community for quite a while, and it has its dip uh, ups and downs, its dips and and dives and ascensions in terms of attention. But I th thought thought uh, Plain Gia would be a really great uh, a really great supplement to go through that uh, I feel has immense empty spaces for creativity, but also has a setting that I think. Um, it, it can be a little bit divisive, but I but I love it. And what I mean by divisive is that it's Dungeons and Dragons and dinosaurs, and sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes that isn't good at all. Okay, so this is a two bit two page spread. This is the cover, or what would we normally consider the cover of the book. Uh, on the left side is actually the back of the book, and then we have the spine in the middle and the front. And here on the back of the spine, I mean, the back of the book, it says Plain Gia is Stone Age fantasy role playing, which is, you know, a very easy. It's not even an elevator pitch. It's the byline of this entire concept. And you'll see as we, we move forward uh, in the first and wildest of all worlds where the planes of existence have yet to be separated, drawn from the traditions of sword and sorcery pulp adventure infused with the blood pounding thrills of epic role playing and caught in the jaws of our own primordial dreams plain gia is a world of heroes who feel the cold wind raise a chill of hunt and hope on their raw skin the lands of plain gia rise from our earliest ancestral memory a world we barely recognize but which holds all the raw adventure we can imagine and uh, i think that's a great that is an excellent overview of Plain Gia and uh, what it highlights. I'm going to uh, keep the clickety clacks to a minimum here. Sorry, 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 because I want this to be as large as possible as we page through this. There we go. Okay, now we're going to get away from the clickety clacking here. Um, yes, it is called the Star Shaman's Star Shaman Song of Plain Gia. And uh, of course, if you guys have any questions, and I'll I'll reinforce this as we go along, uh, move forward on the channel. Uh, if you have any specific questions or comments or concerns or something, uh, in, in all caps, please put question in front of it, or even just put DBJ in front if you want to address me specifically. And I will be taking a look at all of the, uh, the co-hosts who are here live on the show. Um, but yeah, that's it. So let's go through the through this and I will check in with you guys as we move on. So here we have a, there's a ton of great art in this, in this particular, uh, this particular book. It's absolutely wonderful. And actually they do something here that's pretty interesting. And of course, as you, as you move along, you'll see there's a term that they use in here called stone punk. And you'll see with a lot of the artwork and such what they mean by stone punk. But yeah, uh, what I love here are the art credits. Uh, they on every page they give the the name of the artwork and the person who did it, which I actually I, I love a lot. Um, it, it shouts out the the artists that were used and you know a a title for the piece of art that you might want to use for your own game. So you know, like right here on a page uh, two eighty six is a fungal bugbear, and I'm like, what? Huh? <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I, I can't wait to see it. All right, so here we have a traveler with a, uh, it will, I, yeah, I guess it's a little triceratops. I see three horns. I see three horns. Mm -hmm. Just moving along. Seems a little cal calm for a world that's so, so wild. 
Yes, this is the uh, this is the OGL that everyone's been talking about. There's the uh, open game license version 1.0a. Yep, right there. Oh man, how have we gone through so many ups and downs over the past past, past last month? Mm -mm -mm. And then we have this is um produced by Atlas Games. And after listening to a couple of podcasts from from the creator, I think he had a great idea. And Atlas Games was like, you know what? I think we'll do it. We'll we'll pr produce this. So it's pretty great. Of course, we have our um, table of contents and a preface. Uh, he mentions that 10,000 BC was the thing that got David Somerville to want to write this. For me, in my age, it was, um, uh, I was about to say Ring of Fire. It was uh, Chariots of, not Chariots of Fire. Oh, now now my brain just, <laughs> my brain just farted on me. Um, it was a, a prehistoric movie with no English language in it at all with uh, Ray Don Chong and some other people in it. I can't remember. <laughs> Mike says, Fungal Bugbear was my Black Sabbath cover band. Oh, man. And so there's some great artwork here. And you'll notice that as, as we move along, Quest for Fire. Thank you. I was like, Chariots of Fire? That was a, that's not the right movie I'm thinking of. Thank you, Quest for Fire. Uh, so, so Some people out there are uh, of, of an age of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them rubbing their, their gray hairs on their chin as well. Yeah, it's, it was Quest for Fire. That's the one that really taught me. Um, right here, I believe, is an in this world's elf. And they have like a translucent skin. You don't really see it here in this image, but it, it goes on. There Now, this is a setting book. And the setting book, of course, you cannot play the... Not of course. Normally in setting books, you can't play the book by itself. So you need fifth edition to do so. Uh, this was started, I think, a year and a half ago, if I'm not mistaken. But there's something that that I love. Let me go back to um to this piece of artwork when I talk about this. There's something that I love that's that people are doing in setting books recently. And it's like a it's a it, it's the rules of the world. It's a primer. It's like Usually it's only maybe two to 10 pages long and gives you a, an overview of like, hey, listen, here's what the, the world's about. Here's what to expect. And what I love about these primers is that while they are becoming a tradition in the tabletop RPG uh, community, maybe some people say, hey, change it up a little bit. What I like about the commonality is open up the front book, you're, 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 they give you everything you need to know. Here's what's expected. Here's what it's about. So, of course, on this page, you see um, this plain, This is plain Gia, a, a primordial fantasy. We have a title here, A World of, of Bone and Fire. The clan, clan fire is sacred, un, unfamiliar, everything. And these are the elements in the game that I like when it's exposed to you that I really like uh, are given to me right up front. Like, for example, with unfamiliar everything, Nothing is as expected in Plain Gia. And that sets you right up that, listen, what you think you know in, in tabletop fantasy is going to be different here. And this book gives you plenty of like optional, like random charts and optional rules to change everything that you think you know. Um, so uh, the gods, uh, giants, oozes, dragons, all of those kind of things, they exist in this world, but they're going to be a bit different than what you think they are. Um, including the idea of the gods, which is kind of strange but cool. Um, on this one, a world of of bone and fire, essentially, you know, steel and iron and those kind of things. You're not going to see that. This is all about um, primordial, uh, prehistoric uh, adventure. So instead of like finding a wizard and finding a sage and going to town and having something crafted, you're going to have to craft that out on your um, in the world on your own or find it out there in the world. So you may not find a place like an apothecary or an alchemist, but you may find a tree with large fruits on it. And those fruits could represent potions that you might want to, um, that you may find in a normal adventure or something. Uh, the clan fire is sacred. And here it says the clan fire replaces the tavern. So a clan fire is like, 
both a place that your player characters may create when you're traveling, traveling with a clan, as well as the fact that when your player characters come across other cultures and other places, they they may establish a clan fire, and that clan fire is the equivalent of what we would see in a tavern in a regular role playing game. I hope is that a person about to punch a T Rex looking thing? I think that is. It's a s- stone shouldered dwarf over here. Every place has its god. This is something. Uh, quite a bit different in this world where they mention that every place has a God because the gods haven't, the gods, the planes of existence, um, they, they don't exist yet in this world. So a in this world, a cleric, we'll get to the point, but there are shamans in this world, which are basically uh, clerics. And a shaman may have, not have a specific domain that we think of But instead, the domain, you have to beseech the gods that exist in in different regions to beseech them to use their power. So it's like being a cleric without having your own domain, but your domain keeps changing based on the gods that exist in and around this world. And I I really like that. Mike says, yeah, I wrote one for Ember. I ran the risk of lore dumping, but since the world is so different, it needed to set expectations. And I and I really like that. Like between setting like four to ten, basically expectations. It's it's like an in-world lore that is a is a meta game for players to understand what the world is about. Right. So if you have your own setting, let's say it's I'm I'm going to way out of a pre prehistory and you're going to Cyberpunk, and you write into your your opening. Thing like um, corporations are not to be trusted. That's like a law of your of this setting, right? And even if the players take money from corporations and it's cyberpunk and they think they're going to move up, you know, but there's that law like corporations are not to be trusted or something of that nature. You could come up with a lot of things. There's one written for um, things from the flood, tales from the loop, and things from the flood. And in tales from the loop, you play children, and in one of theirs, they're things written down it says um adults are naive and oblivious to the challenges of children meaning that your your kids on bikes riding around trying to solve all kinds of things in this game game world you can't rely on the adults to solve your problems you're gonna have to do it yourself and while that is a little bit metagamey i really like that yeah, Mike says, you may need to seek out a feared witch doctor who lives alone in the mountains. They may be able to cure your companion's disease, but the journey may kill him. It's all about risk. Yeah. And, and like you're, you're mentioning uh, in Ember, Mike says, uh, in Ember, the gods were village, nature, or cultural spirits, kind of like how Koatoa, in their way, de- deify others through belief. Exactly. And I, I like that. I like that a lot. And they also make a blurb here about stone punk. Um, let your imagination run wild within the limits of the taboos. Build cities on the backs of mammoths, hang wooden temples from giant trees, craft great hang gliders that soar on volcanic heat. Whatever it can be made with skill and simple tools, bring into your vibrant Stone Age world. And I love that. Um, there are also there's also something here called the black taboos. And again, this is a this is an in-world thing that creates a meta game thesis for the world if players want to be part of it so what so the black taboos are basically things that you're not allowed to do in this world and everyone believes it uh there's a force in the cosmos known as the hounds of blind heaven nobody knows where they come from but one thing is certain breaking the so-called black taboos rouses their wrath and means certain death and the black taboos are oops i didn't mean to do that are writing is death where's the other one uh, no number after nine and no wheels or money. So essentially in this world, there is a, a force out there and a fear and maybe even some kind of like universal cultural standards where, you know, writing is not a good thing. Um, counting past nine is not a good thing. And there are no wheels. So there are no carts. Uh, the wheel hasn't been so-called invented. There's no money. 
and um, it brings about these things known as the hounds. Now, there is a part in the book where it says, you know, you can ignore that if you want to. But really what they're trying to say is uh, if you want for players who are are who really want to push against the boundaries of what this is supposed to be uh, a, a prime primordial you know adventure there's some players that are like yeah i want to play in it for the whole purpose of bringing their modern sensibilities to the get to this uh, world and you're not supposed to and so there are there can be a force out there oh lastly uh they're known as kinships in in other games also known as races but they just call them kinships here big no big deal it seems like every third party creator is is solving the problem that fifth edition thinks that they they're they're struggling to survive sur- struggling to solve it's really weird um you talk about classes and the basically part one of the book is all player facing part two is for game masters mm-hmm. answer the howl here we go to part one i don't know if riding a giant sloth is is your best mode of transportation but i bet it's the most comfortable i don't know if they're sloths but they look like them or maybe they burrow hmm. no characters uh hard to tell but on the left there's a, a dwarf and you've got like actual stone on your skin i believe that's a human in the middle and an elf on the other side they're kind of translucent you can kind of see through the legs and kind of the boots a little bit there are wrappings on the arms of this guy and it, yeah it's a little difficult to see that but yeah they're translucent they're like formed from dream and memory and such now, under this is for player facing. Under wilderness, there's three themes of kinetic action, primordial horror, and mystic awe. And essentially, the, the, what they're trying to get across here is is to not think of classic fantasy, but to think of it as uh, something very, very new. John Wright says, "Spirits of nature and of ancestors reminds me a bit of Shinto from Japan." Yeah, Mike says, "I love games like this, but I fear my table would just reenact the Flintstones." <laughs> hey, hey, listen, the Flintstones went through my mind too. Um, but you, this book gives you plenty of reminders as to what something, what we think of, and what you can reimagine it in this this game. So, for prehistoric fantasy, they give us a they do give us a list of like what would it. What in your classic fantasy would it be here in this prehistoric thing? So, of course, they have like ancient kingdoms and airships and blacksmiths or books or tomes. And instead, you they have their equivalent, a powerful or powerful ritualistic clan, a tamed flying behemoth, behemoth uh, a master crafter, or painting or a song, et cetera, et cetera. And like for magic, there aren't wizards in the classic sense instead you have like paintings on walls or you have tattoos or brandings or scarification maybe you have paintings inside of a bear cloak or something like that and of course there are songs written as well so yeah you won't find spell books in this and also if i can go back just a little bit also with this you know one of many types of lists as well. If you have an old adventure or one that you want to like reskin a little bit for this prehistoric realm, you could do it. So if you have guards and knights or like gold coins or a king or a noble or a library, you could then reskin that for this this game. Uh, so to try to make it a little bit easier. I love this artwork. Talks about the five senses and including them, the clan fire, and protecting the clan, the honor of the clan fire, appease the gods, and craft what you need, make friends and enemies. And the clan fire is is an in-world way to, it's like a, it is a, like a tavern, the clan fire is a microcosm of the world or setting it or region in which the player characters are, are, are traveling right so in in classic fantasy the tavern is a place where you you know you get your quests and you hear rumors and and maybe you hear about politics and some of the fears that people have in the region it's it's basically a place 
a air quotes safe haven, although we know that plenty of taverns have been burned down by player characters. They kind of make it dangerous on their own. But the tavern is also a place to find out rumors and to find out about the, I don't know, hobgoblin war band that's there. Or maybe there are ogres stealing uh, barrels of mead. Or maybe there's a dragon on, you know, living in the, the cliffs of a nearby mountain and such. The clan fire is exactly the same way. And uh, the the clan fire is also like neutral territory. So players may, may interact with uh, beings or advers uh, adversaries or avatars or agents of the people that they may come in conflict with. And also a place to tell, tell stories. And you, could, you can shape your clan fire any way you want to, to make it more thematic for your world, such as like... Um, such as songs or different types of um, dances or magic that's presumed. And then you can even have like uh, um, most important people sitting close to the fire or the mysterious ones sitting to the outside of the fire in the shadows and things like that. So it's kind of cool. We talk about taming and uh, tanning and trading and things of that nature, hunting, which might become very important. And, I think this setting, much like uh, the classic Dark Sun setting, is one in which finding shelter, hunting for food, um, uh, taming beasts and things are rewards unto themselves. Finding shelter should be a reward unto itself. They talk about wilderness survival and travel. Now, this does use classic 5th edition, and um, we, we understand that 5th edition does have a lot of easy buttons and this gives some hints as to like hey say like hey listen if your characters can't get lost well here's an option optional thing to throw that into the world if your characters can instantly find food well maybe here's some options to make maybe finding food a little bit different uh add some add some danger some hazards some challenges in that risk reward yep exploring a loop closer looks going further and also brings up the fact that like maybe the player characters are, you, you know, maybe they're badasses, but maybe they are protecting people who don't know, you know, don't have the wherewithal to protect themselves, which um, I like because that becomes a vector for a vector for conflict and problem solving as well. Like five players trying to get across a dangerous land, each of them badass characters might not be bad, but if it's 50 of them and most of them are non-combatants, then that becomes something else. So. Yeah, talk about harvesting, dangers and such. And this is all the this is actually all the player facing stuff, basically to get the players involved in like, hey, listen, this isn't your normal world. Talks about player options and such, um, weapon shattering, star magic, raw magic, blood offerings, and things of that nature. Let me get back to the chat here. See what you guys just say. Oh, <laughs> you haven't said it much more. All right, so let's get to personal omens, some stories, motivations. Why would people travel? Um, all kinds of trinkets and turning those trinkets into stories. Um, I've always liked the idea of trinkets, but I felt like once it was introduced to fifth edition, I think they could have done a lot more with it. Uh, but I love the idea of trinkets because it's like it's basically storytelling. We could bring it up at any time. What is that? A dwarf next to a person of color? I love it. These are the kinships or the races, and they talk a little bit about um, about the fact that they are brand new to this world. So, um, what we consider to be classic. This is the beginning of the classic nature of a lot of these races. I still love this translucentness that is done with this artwork. Um, you could see that they're with this character with the blue, bluish translucent skin. You can kind of see their clothing through their body on the other side. I think it's kind of cool. Elves, halflings, humans. Don't know where this gentleman got this blue cat from, but I think it's really cool. I don't even know if it's a cat. Eh, maybe a cat. Dragonborn, God marked. Sorry. God marked are basically tieflings, those whose blood is touched by the gods, changed by the gods. There's a 
arctic place with some tiefling horns. Ah, my locks used to look like that. Now they're like gray shrouded <laughs> gnomes. I don't think this gnome partic particularly wants to be bothered by this probably human being, unless they're selling some wares. Orcs, basically, half orcs. Tree people. So let me get to we got we go past that. Half oozes. There's a there's a I don't know if it's an ooze, but it looks kind of cool. There it is. There's a piece of art. <laughs> <laughs> Half ooze features, variances, things like that. Kind of stretchy, sticky. <laughs> oh, man. But something else that I really like, oh, Sauron's uh, Saurian traits. So you can play a uh, humanoid dinosaur. Kind of cool. Should, sorry, almost passed it by. Looks. Um, I like this dinosaur. And I like this dinosaur person, but I can't remember the name of it. They got a, they have a tail with like, um, like a bludgeoning tail with like uh, spikes on it or something. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons and dinosaurs. Some people can't stand dinosaurs, but they're in in their Dungeons and Dragons. It's kind of weird to have dinosaurs side by side with dragons, but whatever. Love it. Go for it, goblin. I think, I think you're gonna die. Get back into the chat. Mm -mm. John Rice says, is the scope limited to just the hunter-gatherer era, or can you settle near natural resources and attempt to domesticate flora and fauna to start to plant the seeds of civilization? That is that is the... Okay. Yes. I'm going to say yes and no, and hey, this, is how the, this is how the game suggests. The, the game suggests that that isn't possible. In, in other words, they want you as player characters to go out there and to, to explore the world as a first step. But then as, the, as you start to read through this book, you'll notice that settling down and starting a civilization and moving away from hunting and gathering, uh, if the player characters want to do it, it is them establishing what we would think of as the prehistory pre of what we consider modern fantasy, which is strange, right? But yes. So the answer is yes, but they really say like, why don't you go out and adventure a little bit or a little bit more before you start settling down? Now for me, I would do that. I would allow that straight up, like from the very beginning. And maybe the quest is the players do become part of a clan and maybe they do, um, gain a following and then eventually you know, much like player characters retiring, maybe they could retire to do that. Or from day one, they could actually start out that way and try to find a place, a haven that they could settle and try to domesticate and try to protect them and have a protectorate and have things come after them. And then that would maybe make the player characters a little bit more reactionary than proactive, than reactive. But but I, I would I, I think that story idea is great. Um, right now, I'm what I'm doing is I'm paging through a lot of character options um, from tattoos to from the character class options and how they are expanded upon or changed a little bit. Or sometimes it's just the wording that's changed that is changed rather than the game mechanics. Like, for example, um, I'm pausing here on the Warlock. So there's the Pact, Pact of the Scar. And so it's not truly being like, it is being a warlock, but it's not what we consider in modern fantasy. It's again, prehistoric. So may, maybe the, the character is, um, you know, attacked or something in a particular region and they survive, but only by the, the good graces of the thing that attacked them in this region. And now they are quote unquote, a warlock, but maybe there, there isn't a sentience even in the thing that attack them, it might, it's almost like being a warlock in a lycanthrope of sorts, maybe, or maybe there is a dark power or a godling that is like a proto godling that is trying to um, possess the character or give the, that PC um, 
instruction so that it could gain power or something like that. Um, again, this is very much primordial. So all the things that we, th what I like about this as well is all the things we think of in modern fantasy haven't happened yet. And the player characters might actually be the historians in a, in a uh, new world. So it's kind of cool. Uh, let's go back into the chat. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there, uh, J Dub. Like in terms of just could, could they bring about the seeds of, of, um, could, could they bring about the seeds of, of civilization in a world that's wild, and uh, much like the, the movie that I brought up, Quest for Fire. You see that in that in that Quest for Fire movie, where spoiler alert for like a thirty year old plus movie, but one of the one of the characters in the story, they they have fire, but they only can get the fire from a lightning bolt, and then if, and there's they go on a search because after a big storm, lightning strikes a place very far away, which causes a fire, and they have to go on a quest for fire to go get that fire, and then they realize that. Um, there are people out there who are learning new things and they actually learn how to create fire on their own uh, towards the end of the movie. And it's pretty cool. Um, here we have the backgrounds, the skill proficiencies that are associated with them, the tool proficiencies, some languages and feature. And so there are different types of languages in this world. And of course, in a, you know, uh, primeval, uh, you know, world of course there's going to be different types of languages because they're going to they're going to be uh proto languages in many ways ape clan is all these are all backgrounds we've seen these before with the backgrounds with the bonds and flaws and such even though fifth edition itself has kind of moved away a little bit from uh from these things but i don't know I, i've always liked the backgrounds the way they were uh without adding player I don't know, player growth to it with that, without adding feats and things. I think that was a bad move for on their part for my, just for me. Iron Clan, these are all different. I, I mean, we could read through all these, but it would take forever. Uh, Raiders and Savant. Um, it, the, the way I'm paging through this, you can tell that each of these has their own page. And I, I kind of like page layouts that do that, where all the information begins and, and ends on that particular page. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of an art to do that in terms of getting the, it, there's an art in layout that Mike in the chat knows very much about. And it requires having the right word count, the right layout, the, the right font size, a, maybe a, a piece of art that you throw in there and that kind of thing. And it, layout is an art unto itself that sometimes people, it's very invisible. You, you know when it's done bad because your eye finds the problems in it. And you know it's done well when you don't notice it at all. You, you actually, you know it's perfectly done whenever you, some of your, your favorite books that you could page through very easily, I can almost guarantee you were laid out by somebody who did an excellent job. So here we talk about um, barter and trade and that there are there are no coins. Let's see what Mike has to say about this. <laughs> Dr. Rice, like technology. There, there is society and technology in this uh in this world. It is very much a stone punk type of setting, but it is not, it's specifically stated that it's not widespread. You might find find regions, and maybe the player characters start to assemble this, these kind of things. Mike says, sorry, I was driving. No problem. Warlocks possibly empowered by pain or near-death experiences. Absolutely. Possibly de uh, deifying the animal or event that scarred them. The life-changing experience empowers them. Absolutely. And uh, again, this, this setting book is very much like, when in doubt, reskin what you know rather than have to make up new rules, right? Which is why... A, a cleric and a shaman essentially are the exact same things. Uh, this goes into currency conversions, essentially one gold piece, and it talks about different kinds of foods and, and trading and things like that. And um, so like one one portion of salt or PS is uh, one, equal to one gold piece or five meals or one skin of wine. They talk about raw goods, like 25 bundles of dry sticks or one sack of flint plants or feathers, et cetera, et cetera. 
crafted goods, uh, one knife or five jars or one tanned leather hide. Uh, easy labor, 15 hours is about one gold piece or hard or skilled labor is about five to one gold piece. And there are no gold pieces, of course, in this world. Uh, most of it's they talk about in PS or portions of salt or salt portions. Uh, or you could just talk about them as as raw goods and whatnot. And, and I, I would even suggest basically depending on how much civilization there is that a small tribe 50 or less might only you know have raw goods whereas more of a city might have the equivalent of a city might use salt specifically as as near coin and of here over here there's like gear names talking about like the appearance materials and behavior of gear and just saying like just you know rename the gear that exists out there right like Maybe it's not a ladder or it's not a wine skin. Maybe they call it something else. Um, names and scars. Some uh, don't. Some don't rely on goods alone to gain advantage of bartering, but also on their reputation or or appearance. Work with your DM to determine what names and scars you have earned, which may act as passive modifiers to your wealth with some trading partners. So, if you let's say you survived an attack from a T Rex. You may be, you know, like an honored hunter or warrior or something, and you may be able to get some free or discounted items. Um, they talk about, uh, you know, changes in armor, uh, armor qualities described like bone shirts and bone mail, scale mail, what is half plate and plate mail, ring mail, splint mail, and talked about it like, uh, like right here, ring mail. Rings can be fashioned of wood. I know my... Um, probably over top of it. Here we go. Uh, ring Rings can be fashioned of wood, antler, coral, shell, chitin or chitin or other workable materials. It sounds very good to me. Uh, like a shield that was made from a, the shell of a turtle or something like that. All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then here are what we know as the fifth edition things. And they give it their, like here's let me move up a little bit. So under heavy armor, you've got ring mail, bone mail, splint, and plate. And then, it, you know, you go back to the notes like, well, it's not, it is plate mail, but it isn't. <laughs> and then Stone Age uh, weaponry, like an antler claw or a gripstone, an adelatl, uh, clubs, hammers, saws, bolos, and boomerangs. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Uh, metal conversions as well. We've got like Metaled adamantine, gold, iron on one side, and then it's equivalent. So zinc is more like clay. Silver equivalent would be polished wood. Platinum is closer to dragon tooth. Uh, mithril is more like gem weave. Mercury is like oil. Lead is like black clay. Iron is granite. Gold is glass. Copper is basically wood. Adamantine is divine ivory. And metal, any type of metal is basically stone, bone, antler, or wood of any type. Kind of cool. Entering gear. Pools. Someone. Someone's feeling really good launching off of this fire. Somebody else's ass is getting burned. And then we talk about spells and spell effects and uh, what they're related to, some of the somatic components, some of the materials that are used to enable those. So basically changing the the verbal, somatic, and material components around, and just making it much more prehistoric. Uh, optional wolf rules for spell discovery, blood magic, altering spells. Um, some spells refer to metal specifically. For example, heat metal, since there is... Since there is no metal in Plangea, this spell can be substituted with a heat stone spell, which works in exactly the same way, but targets stone instead. There's commune and other divine spells, plane shift and planar spells. Uh, because the planes have not broken away from the material plane yet. So. And then there's a spell list. And this looks sweet as hell. I guess there's lightning coming from the sky that's like enhancing them. Our, our uh, pulp heroes who are about to do battle. I mean, I, I, would, you, 
would you call that a blessed spell or some you know lightning from the skies or something like that? Maybe this this person up here could could actually be standing on something or floating. Could be the the shaman or the cleric using a bless to bless them in their battles or whatnot. Or it could be some other kind of enhancement spell. But I really like it. It's really cool. I don't think the goblins stand a chance. Let's go find ourselves. Here's a vortex of some sort. Stay right here for a minute. Let's get back to the chat. Um, ooh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Mike says, the great sword could be a, try this one, DBJ, ma makua hu little, ma kua hu e little. Uh, and you have it down as ma, ma quittle. Ah oh, man, I, I know I'm butchering that. I'm butchering that big time. Sounds very uh, Aztec or Mayan, I believe it would be. And the, the my, my answer to that would be Hell's Yes, <laughs> like like something with like a, um, shark toothed or like um, obsidian stone great club kind of thing, which would be basically like a great sword. I, I'm I'm picturing what it is. I'm knowing butchering his pronunciation, but yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. John uh, John Wright says, it would be cool if the GM could play ancient alien race NPCs that presented themselves as gods and interact in a limited capacity with players, helping or exploiting them, like a like a cue from Star Trek. Uh, yeah, there's a, maybe not something quite what you were thinking, but yes, there is an element of that in this game where uh, we'd have to go on to the Game Master section, because this is all the spell stuff. Not the spells. Symbols and spells. Ah, oh, here we go. For the Game Master. Well, I'm glad they told us that. Is that a D20? No. No. Oh, they... I get it. I, I was like, is that D20 floating over the... <laughs> they know. No, no, no. It's just some kind of monolithic thing floating in the air. Um, oh, they seem kind of warm up there. Traveling along. There are... Here we're getting back into the kinetic action, primordial horror, and um, oh, and, and mystic awe, and how to create those things. And like, for example, with this image right here, we have ourselves our explorers. This is a new world, but you see in the distance, there is, you know, is that construction? Is that an actual bridge? Well, yes, there are communities. Uh, maybe they are otherworldly. Um, like you said, ancient aliens, which I think actually kind of fits into this um, and and such. There are, okay, I know I'm, I'm skipping around here quite a bit, but the idea of things ever changing that the player characters, oh, let me get back to this little piece of art. If you notice, we have ourselves our two adventurers here, but maybe the woods maybe are a little bit dangerous. Um, I'm looking down at the foot right here. Maybe you might want to take a step. You might want to make, like, make, make a successful deck save. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I'm being silly. The the idea is that th yes, the player characters can come across pockets of things that kind of don't fit into a prehistoric world, but they could be any anyway. These are random tables to. Um, for example, when the players come across something like wandering predators or uh, puzzles or traps or the context changes or something like that, it's a way to keep changing things up. For example, uh, there are random tables in here to reskin the vast majority of all your monsters. Um, there are ways to create clans and what their purpose is. Uh, this, this world tree very much reminds me of the, the tree from the movie Avatar, not Avatar, Last Airbender. I'm talking about giant blue-skinned uh, alien avatar in 3D. Um, and what does the clan, what's the, how does the clan survive? What are their purposes? What are they, are, you know, are they cannibalistic? Are they friendly? Um, maybe they are trying to keep back ghosts or something, or they're fighting off hazards, or they're just trying to survive, or they're, maybe they're traitors, that kind of thing. Talks about the layout, the tone, the camp size. Uh, you get all the all the things that you need for the camp. Maybe the camp is starving. Maybe they are over beset by disease. 
what kind of leaders do they have? Uh, what are their abilities? Uh, maybe they are they you know they're led by hunters or are they led by oracles? Maybe they're led by healers or they're led by crafters or something like that. And so then here we have multi-stage list. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, more places, structures. So lots of random lists as well uh, to just draw some inspiration from. I love random lists, but I tend not to roll on them, which is an uh, oxymoronic of me. But I like random lists because random lists just give me something like, oh, I, here's things I can pick from. Yep. All right, let's see. Drop the dice, trace outlines. Talking about creating uh, random places, the clan fire, the benefits of a clan fire, meals, gathering meals, rumors, tasks, commerce. It's a center to, to go back to running the clan fire, uh, clan fire timing and talk about talks and, and you know, how they can be like neutral places to have conversations or a place of healing or a place for the PCs to leave their stuff when they're going out adventuring to come back to the clan. And, and such. And I, I like the idea of players like having to have other responsibilities. Maybe they do have to hunt and bring back enough, hunt and gather to bring back enough food. Or maybe the player characters, um, like J-Dub was saying, maybe they are trying to create civilization and the players need to, I don't know, train some of the clan and use the use of spears to protect themselves during uh, different ways or surviving through the seasons and such. This is a strange image, but kind of cool. It looks like there are um, dinosaurs with multiple platforms on them. And then there are maybe bonded pairs of dinosaurs. I, I would have presumed that they are family and you can walk across them because they have these rope bridges that connect each one of them, which would kind of scare me because if the dinosaurs have to go off and do something or, I don't know, squat and crap or something, what's going on with, you know... <laughs> I'm sure there are ways that how they handle it all, but very cool. Very, very cool going across a, a great landscape. And what, what a great way for the player characters to be like the, the forward uh, um, forward observers for like that. Speed, rest, mobile shelters, temporary sheltering, defenses, that kind of thing. Taming and training monsters. Kind of a uh, Saurian. Not quite dragonborn. I would have just made them the same thing, but whatever. Um, adventure environments. Aberrant vaults. I could see that being the inside of a monstrous uh, gullet. And then different types of uh, ways you can describe those aberrant locations. Apex domains. And then we're going to get to talk about dra dragons, dwarvish ruins. Now see right here, um, J Dub, there is civilization, or there are civilizations. Maybe they are the equivalent of ancient aliens or something like that. I, I will say that while you may see something like this and go, well, this isn't really prehistoric because that would be mean that there was some kind of history beforehand, I would say that, you know, it you, we really do want to make things um we really do want to make things very interesting for our, our player characters. So sometimes if there's something out there that the players aren't familiar with and they go, wait a minute, if we're the first that are supposed to be here, why are there ruins, right? Then then you can start ha have to answer those questions like, were they beings from another world? Are there, um, are, are there ancient gi gigantic beings out there that are leaving these things that have passed away from an ancient time long ago and maybe this is the, the age of man or something? Him, Mike agrees with me. Random lists are great for inspiration. This world sounds tailor-made for Knowles as either characters or villains. Absolutely. The dinosaur you were trying to remember was the Ankylosaur. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yes, that's the one with the, with, with the, uh, what would you call it? Like, um, beat ass tail <laughs> with the, the blunt tail and the, the, uh, uh, blunt spiked armor, kind of like a turtle. Yeah. Ankylosaur. That's it. World of dreams, worlds of nightmare. And mind you, it, the name of this is called Plain Gia, and the first part of that, Plain, and the second part, Gia, kind of reminds us of how our Earth 
used to have the continents together and they start to split and break apart. It's the same thing here with the planes of existence. So the plane of dream, plane the, the Feywild, if you want to say that, the shadow realm, uh, the, the planes of the elemental planes, the planes of, of the gods, the planes of demons and fiends, of celestials, they don't exist as planes yet. They're, they are... You can physically walk or and or swim or climb or swing or burrow to these places and so it's not as if planar magic isn't planar it is going over that through that valley or crossing the, that mountain range or getting through the desolate swamp or you know maybe these are places where you know that volcano and the plane of fire are kind of one in the same they talk about genre tropes villainous schemes war using science fiction um Introduce using the setting like play as time tra travelers or spacefarers who have found yourselves stranded in a strange era, dimension, or alien world. Peel back the layers of the seeming primor primitivism to discover the advanced technology hidden below the surface and scrape together enough raw materials to construct a way back to the stars. And essentially it's like, well, maybe prehistory isn't your thing, but you really want the book. So here are ways to like kind of add that into your your basic 5e adventure talking about westerns pirates detectives spies modifying plain gia for other uh, things um here's you talk about the black taboos uh the black taboos include no writing no numbers over nine no currency no wheels and and how to break that if you want to so um so um John Wright mentioned that about like, well, what if the player characters want to establish the first, become what we today know as well, the cradle of civilization? Uh, I would say, yeah. Um, and so this talks about the hounds, like, you know, are, are they physical hounds? Is it just a cultural thing? And then how to have hound free adventures, such as or origin adventures, maybe, ba ba maybe the player characters are literally telling the story of where things in our modern fantasy come from um uh historically accurate you know right like in, in in earth's history no hounds were required to enforce the stone age if your players buy into the truth that technology need not progress by leaps and bounds and that people lived at a set technological level for generations upon generations the black taboos become unnecessary and you can simply settle into a world that's more grounded in the stone age of our own history which is another thing right like yes we know magic didn't exist in our world um, at least most of us believe that, but there's also the idea that like, you know, today we know of technology changing things by leaps and bounds, but back in the day, generations and generations lived and died without a change in their world. Even though we today have learned from those, those small increments of changes until the acceleration of technology. So, yep, yep, yep. Uh, slavery is evil that in there um altering the empires maybe some of these empires are closed off they want to keep all their resources to themselves including the resources of uh knowledge so the volcano spewing forth and a couple of people down there at the bottom yep sound like pcs to me the primordial world and in, in the, the cosmology sea of stars here's the uh here's a map of the world and as you uh, they make the claim that as you go towards the edges of this world you're basically going into another plane of existence the scorch waste up the top up the top we've got um mountains to to the left side the fang uh a rock and flame and then the quake waste all the way to the left and to the right the fang of wind and sand howling chasm the air empires the wind wastes to the very right and at the very bottom, the fang of shadow and thunder, the brine wastes and uh, slime fang and the salt fangs and the sea empire. And I like, <laughs> I like how they did this. Sorry. I like how they did this on the map. They have like hollows and, and adventure sites and settlements in it. And then it says scale, scale to what? <laughs> Thanks, thanks for putting a line with the little Terminators at the end, but I'm not exactly sure what that scale is supposed to mean, which is, of course, you, you can make it up on your own, right? Like, is that is that one day's travel? Is that 500 miles? Is that, you know, 
you know, 300 kilometers, who knows? Up to you. And then let's get into, yeah, this is where it really turns from, from primordial to magic. Let's get back into the chat and our custom. Mm -mm. Mike says, uh, Forgotten Realms talks of ancient civilizations of dragons and giants. This setting allows you to establish that. I tried that in Ember. Hill giant chieftains ruling great wit swaths of land and wyverns defending massive territories. Stone Age societies could use chunks of turquoise, quartz, or obsidian as currency or shells, as we've done in cultures of our own world. Absolutely. Yeah, Mike says, yeah, I'd set the scale as one day. Yeah, it's it's very, like, this is, again, this being primordial, modern fantasy always talks about what happened in the ancient past. Well, why don't we describe what happened in the ancient past, right? Like, you know, we don't, were, were we... Where did the giants come from? If there were giants, what were they like? And we're going to get into some of the imagery here as we get along. Um, this is talking about the different clans, where they live, some of their, uh, that were talked about earlier, like the ape clan. Um, this talks about a lot of the regions, like the winter winter wastes and things like that. Um, people living on the, the edge of the air, the elemental plane of, well, not plane of air, but the, the location of air. It was the winter location. Edge gather, and these are like small, um, locational advent adventuring. Like, hey, here's a place, here's some maps, here's where people live, and then you can have kind of your own, your own um, adventures there. Let's keep going, go, go, go. Come on, I want to go past it because I know if I there it goes. Here's a place, edges of a civilization, high walled Akman, the great empires, fire empire. Stone Age Captivity. Now, listen. Eh, I don't think I don't think uh, Neanderthals are building these kind of things, right? Uh, this is definitely built by, you know, a, a, some kind of civilization that has existed long before the player characters start wandering around. And of course, you could find, you know, you could say, are, are they going to expand? Why haven't they expanded? Um, there are people walking up to this location. You know, is it because of their brilliance? Do, are the people that live there, have this been given to them by, by so-called the gods that they've um, created for themselves? This one is the sea. This is actually kind of cool. You can see in the background, they look to be human-sized humanoids. And then this piece of art continues on to this side where you see the giants... And then, boom, maybe someone trying to fart the left corner, maybe beseeching them for some information or basically begging them, like, please let my people go. Kingdoms of the dead, some of the hazards there. Um, talking about high level adventuring as well. When the players go on to these places in the far reaches, the far corners of the world. Heck, who, who knows? The player characters might even uncover you know, like the, the Olympian gods them, themselves or something like that. Uh, John Rice says, so, um, Saurians, ooh. Saurians remind me of the Saurials from the Forgotten Realms, Wyvern's Spur Trilogy novels. I haven't read them. Their inspiration for the CRPG, The Curse of the Azure Bonds. I remember that one. Uh, Saurials weren't from Faerun, but another plane. Hmm. It was, but, but I bet physically there, but I mean, not physically. Uh, the way they are displayed, it's probably the same thing. Um, as a matter of fact, who's to say that in Plain Gia, this isn't the, the origin of all the other settings of existence in modern fantasy, right? It's got to start from somewhere. Who's to say that the multiverse hadn't started from this place? Uh, Mike says, imagine a campaign where you play the same character, but in multiple settings or times. Each, each a reincarnation. Playing here, or Greyhawk, or Eberron, same character, but experiencing echoes of, of themselves, including this world. Maybe levels five through nine here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that would be kind of cool. Like you're playing your you're playing your ancient self, and you've existed and and you. It's like in the old days, this is what happened, and you're like, I remember that for some reason, and then boom, things. <laughs> yeah, and we go through factions, and and how first there are a number of factions. And then uh, how to create your own factions. 
So we've got like the Lion Clan and uh, Seer Fall and the Whale Clans and things like that. And then, of course, um, all kinds of threats, creatures, things of that nature. And it tells you what page they're on and what kind of threats. And then we get into making up your own. Like, for example, what kind of threat is this? Is, a, is that a troll? Is that a bear? What the hell is that? I don't think they should be happy. Be a little bit scared of that thing. Half giant ape clan. There we go. There's another little portrayal of civilization with animals and things around. I want to get to the random tables. Here's a really cool way to really change. There we go, spells. It's probably the equivalent of a wizard right here, finding new spells or maybe crafting their own. Or that's where they, they, they found a cave where they can um, put all of the lore that they've gotten. Or maybe they found out something. Yeah, maybe it's just plain old information. I know riding. Woohoo! Proto birds, triceratops in the background. And I don't remember the name of that dinosaur to the very left, but kind of cool. Cool. These are the herd, magic, herd types, making different types of herds. Maybe the players have to, like, it's a herd. Free Citadel. It looks a little bit more modern, that individual. There's a subterranean map, looks kind of complicated to me, but whatever. The parapets, free citadel, carved quarter, and the vaults. A little place to have some adventure. And people out in the wild. For hire. Come on, I, I remember it. I should have clicked it down. Interesting individual here. Drew it, maybe? Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. -mm 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 -mm. Using plants for armor. 19 AC. Oop, this is a really good map right here. I like this. I like these uh, uh, not asymmetrical. I can't remember the name of it. Parasur uh, Parasaurolophus. Is that the name of it? <laughs> Mike's like, like Quantum Leap? Yeah, okay, okay. Isometric, thank you very much. Oof, almost like asymmetric. I don't know. I can smell the farts coming out of my brain right now, man. See or fall, the exterior of it. That's really cool. It's really cool. Um, Yes, isometric maps. <laughs> I really love them. Hard, I, I try to wrap my head around isometric maps, and I, I, it's hard for me to, to draw them out but I love them anyway. Venom God. I think, I don't know, that that could be a displacer beast maybe or some kind of variation thereof. Do some behaviors. But as we go along down here, looks like something coming from, ah, yes, they're releasing, releasing things into the air maybe. Little tribe here, releasing their ancestors up into the sky. There's also um, some really great tables here, if I can get to them. There we go, threats and making your own threats. Nope, 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 this is still part of the adventures. Don't want to give too much away on that. It's all some tentacles. I have tentacles. Crawling awful. a dragonborn, maybe maybe a halfling or a gnome. We've got another character in the background here, fighting Sauron-like creatures with oozes, maybe. Or maybe they might be sentient. Sauron-like creature, maybe a modified uh, lizard person or um, troglodyte, possibly. Or Saur Saurian. Or Soriel. 
really cool. But anyway, uh, one other thing I will say about this about this uh, setting is that as I'm paging through this, and I know I'm just going to kind of page through, there are a lot of tables here. It's hard to it, it the tables are great as a collection um, rather than stopping on one because what what really happens here is like uh, for example, we have this thing about the winter gods and um, and some of the results. And here under the winter gods, they give you like, uh, you know, some information, but then if you can roll a D6 and in our gaming, our modern fantasy, we know what Vrox or Herzu or Glyabrazu or Merylis are or ba Baylors are, but they're listed under here under the winter gods. So not only is the context changed in terms of where the PCs may encounter these beings, also with new names and what their their capabilities are, the player characters are not even going to know what they are, especially when we use um, physical descriptions, location descriptions, and things like that to change exactly what they are, right? Like, you know, bearded devils, barbed, chained, bone, Irenees, and ice devils are all different. And here you have different names for them and where they're located and such. And yes, the, the players are not going down into the nine hells or the abyss. All they're doing is just walking along and finding these locations. And where's the it's kind of a cool picture here this individual cool decadence the air empire mm. she's probably human here we have uh there we have maybe frost giants there's some human beings stuck in these uh cages no this guy on the left is like i gotta go both to the bathroom and get out of here <laughs> giant with a pterodactyl snow in his wings it's just like that's my pet falcon cool is this a these are this is a vampire story but some kind of like devil chained in the background it's kind of weird but i love it i love it so much there's i don't know if they're giant sized or not Three and nine, the three and nine. Most ancient of vampires are the three above all others in the, the gift of thirst. Really cool. And then he end this. These are, I bet these were um, Kickstarter adventures that were added to the book. And then towards the end here, ooh, I love, there's another city, maybe subterranean city with a, a big, uh, Guardian, maybe Stone Guardian at the uh, at the very edges of it. Crazy, maybe an undead city or something like that. But they give you. I'm trying to get to the part where it tells you about how to make up your own, um, a reskin, reflavor, reuse monsters and such. And uh, I don't know why I didn't page 180 something. Um, cool piece of art here. Always a shame to take a good piece of art and then smudge it away for for flavor, but yeah, <laughs> yeah a little little chilly, a little chilly. Ton of ton of random tables, a ton. Uh, treasures, talking about treasures. Uh, some of those treasures might be scars and names that you may gain as you move along. Yeah, Mike says, great setting for you on tea cultures. I could see hags as a regular part of this setting, too. I think all of those, like, uh, I'm going to call them lieutenant monsters, um, hags, ogre magi, also known as oni, uh, rakshasa, um, oh, man, some, uh, uh, sphinxes, naga, um, uh, yuan tea. Uh, there's, there's a couple more there, uh, doppelgangers. Um, I'm, I'm, I call them lieutenant monsters. There's like between, say, CR level four to like 10 ish, where they make great, at low levels, they make great um, apex monsters that P PCs can destroy, who then realize that they are just the lieutenants of even greater evils. And so I love those mid level monster cr sevens and eights and such where they're they're brilliant enough to have their own like in this prehistoric world where they could have their own clans they've kind of carved themselves out their own uh, location but then at the same time 
there are powers out there that could easily defeat them. And so they're always gathering power, always gathering allies, always gathering um, slaves and indentured servants and, and those kind of things. They're always parlaying to increase their power. Uh, this image here is about masks and the, the masks have, are basically a new thing, kind of like wands and staves and rods, but more or less allowing you to take on the powers of uh, other monsters and things. Books have become chants, spell scrolls have become talismans, magic masks, and how common, rare, and unrare they are. Um, they have charges to them, you know, like Mask of the Unicorn. This mask of purest white with a spiraling horn grants you a healing touch. When you expend a charge, you can touch another creature uh, with the mask's horn. The target magically regains 2d8 plus 2 hit points. In addition, the touch removes all diseases and neutralizes all poisons afflicting the target. I think it's a little too powerful for this world, but that, but it's, it, again, this is based on 5th edition. So, But yeah, th there's taking you know a mask and allowing you to take on that creature. Plus, there's a story element to that as well. Uh, maybe a mask once needs to be returned or people want to um, uh, respect those who have a mask of a particular type. Like there's a crossbow, throw magic items, uh, a lot of reskinned magic items. looks like there's like some kind of plate armor here. Let's see if the name of it. I don't remember the name of it. Remoraz armor. Ooh, the Remoraz. That's a, that's a old one. This uh, chitinous or chitinous armor is made from the plates and spines of the Remoraz. While wearing this armor, you have resistance to cold damage. When a creature touches you or hits you with an unarmed strike or natural weapon, you can use your reaction to sear the creature with the innate heat of the Remoraz's plates dealing 1d6 fire damage. The Remoraz. That's another puzzle monster that I, that I really like. I like this. It's really colorful. Hey, dino people with your saber tooth uh, pets. Awesome. Odds and monsters. So here, I, I know I had to get to this point. Let me, let me page down to a piece of art so I can stop right there. People praying. They're praying to the great crotch. Okay, let's not do that. Uh, let's stop right there. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, Mike says, I think you hit gold with Sphinx. A Sphinx will want to create a civilization, but will be abated by the rules of this world. And I think also, uh, basically, this, this is the whole purpose of me getting to the end of here, trying to page through um, uh, awkwardly, is that this, under Gods and Monsters, gives you a ton of tools to reskin, reshape, reuse, repurpose all of the monsters and even gods in your world. So you know, it talks about here about primordial monsters. Plangea is a living world bristling with potential allies and enemies from the most powerful god to the smallest stinging insect. And so they're, what they did is they created a ton, uh, 19 plus, I love this, roll twice and use both results idea because I love that that idea of making a 19 die, uh, 20 D20 table and combining stuff. So they made a bunch of templates that you basically layer over your monsters. So they have templates like armored, amphibious, berserk, Climbing, elemental, frilled, fungal, horned, magical, massive, many-eyed, multi-headed, sailed, slimy, spiny, tentacled, tunneling, undead, and winged. And guess what? They even show you some examples. Like here's an armored um, Atiag. I don't think you need to armor them up. That's a little too scary, right? Uh, and it gives you their abilities. Climbing troll, berserk, um, edder cap, elemental uh, purple worm. A finned coatl, fungal bugbear. There's that fungal bugbear. I don't think it has its head left anymore. I don't think it needs to have one. And then it gives you the effect. So like any creature that has the fungal nomenclature that you add to it is a, it's also a plant. It has the ability of false appearance. While the fungal creature remains motionless, it is ind indistinguishable from ordinary fungus. It has senses. The fungal creature senses the world around it using spores. It has a new action or reaction, such as hallucinogenic spores. Uh, what other ability does it have? A, and a spore speech. And then there's other things like horned. 
This is a horned boule. Um, I don't think land sharks need to have horns. I don't think you need to <laughs> make them any better. And then there's magical, such as like innate spell casting or massive, like this is a massive grick or many eyed or multi headed, like a many eyed cloaker or a multi headed cockatrice, like it needs to turn things to stone three times faster. <laughs> Or a sailed basilisk. I, why fifth edition? This to me, this seems like such a simple thing to to have done for their monster manual that it it, it boggles the mind. Spiny rust monster. I mean, how easy is that? Tentacle, tentacle zorn. What the hell ever? Undead. Is this undead merman? Yep, undead merman and winged abolith. I don't think abolites need to fly. I think they're good where they are. <laughs> anyway, getting back into the chat. We're almost done here. Um, Mike says, Gods and Monsters. Isn't that an X-Men title? I think it is. Geez, I can remember running a cult of the worm around those who thought purple worms were gods. Seem to be normal here. Your horns were boulets. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're getting a little a little late in the in the in the tooth here. But anyway, I just want to show I, I really want to show that part off. Um, talks about making up your own gods in this world because player characters can can actually physically interact with the gods of this world. And those gods may not necessarily be humanoid, but you can like negotiate with them. And those proto gods might be, have been created by say a lost tribe or not, or maybe even a civilization is trying to build or worship their own godling, right? It's like, which came first, the God or the, or the followers? Um, the, it, it, it's, it's very, there is no, truth to which came first right um the people pray to for, for something or someone to help them the thing arrives then they pray to it and the thing gives them power and then they pray to it and the thing gets more power and they pray to it. and so there's this cir circular portion of it and so this allows you to create your own gods or godlings um this is very high level stuff plus maybe the player characters want to create their own uh divine personage and of course, there's a bunch of uh, examples of what they are. Challenge level 23. This is in the, there's a bunch of these in here as well. So anyway, I wanted to show this off. Uh, Plain Gia. These are all gods using the rules above. A chaotic good gargantuan celestial god. Chaotic good is a challenge level 25. Has a bunch of powers. Maybe the maybe the PCs want to destroy or um, banish a god that is allowing maybe a very terrible community to um, grow and expand in this world. Like maybe the player characters are really trying to destroy a particular civilization from gaining a handhold. Maybe they are learning how to create aqua, uh, aqueducts and they are learning how to, um, uh, they are learning the, 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 the nature of, hunting and gathering and turning into more of a, a technological world. And maybe the player characters have to stop that from happening. That'd be pretty cool. These are uh, different types of monsters, legendary creatures that exist in this world. Other type of, you know, non, you know, in our modern context, we call dinosaurs by their scientific names. But in you know <clears throat> in this world they wouldn't be called by their scientific names at all. It'd be a you know a, 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 here's a spider raptor, a tent wing, a swift claw. You know there's there's velociraptor, swift claw. Yep. Large unaligned beast, challenge level two. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, a lot of creatures. Oops. Let's see. Did I miss? Yeah, I missed past, past R work. Doesn't matter. There we go. Riding on the back of a best hop or a praying mantis. I don't know if you, I don't, I don't know if it would want, prefer you to use it as a mount, but okay. I mean, all right, you know, if that's what you want. Wait, I'm not done painting your legs yet. Hold on. Uh, 
Now, ain't that alien? Hello, Droshans who have yet to embrace a victim. Feeble things. That is really cool. Very primordial. Maybe they're a bonded pair or they split up from each other. I don't know. All right, let's get into here. Back into the chat. <laughs> John Wright says, a circle has no beginning. Luna love good. Mm -mm. <laughs> Mike's like, dude, I'm totally stealing the, some of these for Ember. Dire cockatrice. Yeah, you don't need that. Death chickens. Mm -mm -mm. All right, let's get to the very end here. Get to the artwork. I'm sure it's just going to be credits and things like that. A lot of monsters, big, big old things with stats. I think this is a. Is that a boar? Laughing boar. And so a lot of these creatures are just modified versions. And I'm sure they the rules that they have in here, being able to, you know, using like the, um, uh, uh, you know, winged or spined or armored or horned or flying or, you know, scaled and things like that. I'm, I just wish that, that that this part of it by itself, if you could have separated this out and just and just be able to buy this by, its, by itself, I think it's excellent for uh, monster creation and really establishing maybe there's a region where most of the creatures here are horned or can climb spider-like cliff. I mean, can climb like a spider over cliff sides, or maybe they have uh, wings or, or can sail through the air, even though you're using a lot of monsters that don't have wings themselves, simply because that's nasty. That is really nasty. Um, maybe because they are near the, uh, cliffs or plane of air. What what will is the proto version of the plane of air? Large ooze, sticky mouth. Large ooze unaligned. Just that looks a lot different. Has a massive adhesive maw. I love it. I love it. Just reskinning a lot of these things. Terror birds. Yeah, they're not so cute. I don't know if you need a triceratops. Um, being that diesel. <laughs> Somebody's been working out. All right. So we get to the end here of. Yeah, that looks pretty. I'll go back. I'll go back. Multiple eyes, horns, multiple arms, orangutan. Medium celestial, lawful good. Ooh. Doesn't look like it. That's probably scary. Beat ass. It looks like a Yeti of some sort. Woolly Unicorn's Lair. Oh, well, okay. And we get we get to fall asleep. Oh, isn't that nice? We'll end it right here. So, guys, thank you so much for being part of the show. I know it went, went quite long here. Went to page through Plangia. Yeah, imagine a gibbering, gibbering or gibbering mouth or witch doctor in this world. Is it gibbering? See, I think it's gibberish because it's gibbering, but I don't know. Form the word anyway. I that's how I look at it. Yes, the I'm sure the spell checker went it from from gibbering to gibberish, but that's where I, where I do the the soft g gibber instead of gibber. But whatever. Um, but yes, a a witch doctor like that. I mean, basically, you could give a humanoid form to things that don't normally have them like arms and legs, or you could take those away from something that normally does have them. Uh, all kinds of things. But like I said, it's primordial. I mean, how many living things could come out of a primordial ooze in the ground and is a living thing given, uh, giving, uh, given mot uh, ambulatory motion, like arms and legs because the player characters passed by it or something like that. And the, and the, the ooze isn't the dangerous thing, but it spews forth things that have the, 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 the uh, ungainly, ungangly image of what a humanoid being would look like, except it might have like multiple arms and legs or its skeleton falls out of its body and all that kind of stuff. It's, it, it'd be really cool and very hard, very horrific. So anyway, guys, thank you very much for being part of the show. I do have to, to, to get out of here. I thank you so much for being part of it. Uh, went quite late with this one, but I wanted to show Plain Gia. I don't have the physical books yet. They haven't been released, at least uh, haven't arrived here in the States. 
um, we will move on with others of this type. So, guys, have a great day. And I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you do, um, please like, share, subscribe, whatever. Tell your friends, tell your enemies <laughs> that we are here. Guys, have a great one. I will see thee later. Bye. Let's take us out.